Hello, hello everybody. Happy Wednesday and welcome to Let's Talk with Dr. Cindy. As you know, I'm Dr. Cindy Duke, Medical Director, Laboratory Director of the Nevada Fertility Institute, which is located in sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm also a Johns Hopkins and Yale trade board certified obstetrician gynecologist, practicing reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, as well as PhD trained in virology. And today I'm super excited because I have a very special guest joining us. Her name is Shaquina Lockley, and she is a director, a producer, and actually a first time director. And today we're going to talk about one of her passion projects, which is fertility preservation, specifically egg freezing in black women. Uh, she has also produced a film, a documentary film that we will be talking about today. And I'm really excited because we also get to preview the film together here live today. So without any further ado, let's welcome my friend Shaquita Lockley. Hey Shaquita. Hello. Thank you for having me, Dr. Cindy. Hi everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm super excited to have you. And um, you know, this film came to my attention through mutual friends, but then I launched a guest blogging platform on my Dr. Cindy website. I put the call out and lo and behold, within hours of putting the call out for guest blogs, you submitted <laughs> your blog. And it was an amazing blog. And it's all about egg fertility and black women, specifically egg freezing and black women. And you touched on so many amazing points in that blog that as I read it, I was like, you know what? It's not enough to do a guest blog, Cindy. You're going to have to bring these bloggers on to talk with them about their blogs because you, oh my goodness. I just, I loved the, I loved reading it, you know, for full Thank disclosure, you. I edit every single blog that comes in, meaning I get to read it, make sure it fits what we're looking to um, talk about, but also it helps me get to know the writer and I could feel your writing as That's I so read it. And I was, it was almost like a hallelujah moment. Sometimes I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so for anyone who's watching, if you have not yet seen the blog, I encourage you to go to the Dr. Cindy Duke website and go to the guest blog session and look at Shaquita's blog. But in addition, before you do that, let's listen to what she has to say, because she is amazing. So Shaquita, we're going to jump right into it, which is okay. you're a film producer, a documentary film producer. A director, and you've done some amazing work before. What brought you to the world of fertility preservation, egg freezing? How did you come about this? How did I jump off the cliff <laughs> into <laughs> fertility work? Yeah, um, this was not on my life path plan at all. I, mm -hmm. I, I, God brought this to me in the most roundabout way. Um, so I was about to turn forty. Mm -hmm. And, um, or maybe, yeah, I think I was maybe a month before I turned 40. I'm at my gynecologist getting my annual. Um, and she looks at my chart and says, Oh, Miss Lockley, you have a birthday coming up. Your eggs are turning 40. Do you know what you want to do with them? Like, it's not too late. I, I honestly don't know everything else that she said because I just kind of blacked out for a minute. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do I want to do with them? I, I'm not married. Yeah. Do what with them? And I always tell people, like, I knew I work in film and television, so I knew what my next gig was going to be. I knew what my vaca next vacation would be. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I was going to brunch on Sunday. I had no idea at all that there, there was something I should be thinking about um, where my eggs were con concerned. So after that, everywhere I went, mm -hmm. For maybe the next three to six months, um, the topic would come up the, on the fertility spectrum, whether it was from um, one of my line sisters, she wanted to tie her tubes yeah. and the doctors would not tie her tubes because she was um, she didn't have any kids. She was married mm -hmm. at the time and didn't have kids. She was under 40. So they told her she needed her husband's permission and a psych evaluation. Oh, I believed her, but I still thought this is this must just be like an anomaly. This is just only her. Mm -hmm. No, that's what it is. So I started researching and this is a thing. So if a guy wants a vasectomy, he could just pop in, get snipped. If a woman wants to tie her tubes and she doesn't have kids, there's a whole laundry yeah. list of 
stuff that you have to go through. So yeah. from that end of fertility all the way to donor eggs, international donor eggs, egg freezing, within my circle of friends, um, the topic would come up. And mind yeah. you, I'd never heard this. Like, we'd not had these conversations before. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like God was bringing it to me. So I said, I'm going to do a short. Yes. It's going to be 10 to 15 minutes. I'll pay, I have like 15,000 of my money that I'm going to put on this. And that's it. Because I went to Spelman for undergrad. So most of my Yay, friends. Spelman. <laughs> so most of, I have a lot of women friends. I'm mm -hmm. in a sorority. Um, and we have great relationships with all the sororities that were on campus. So yeah. my first circle. We're black women who went to went to school. We have strong families, that sort of thing. And we were not talking about it. So all of a sudden, this topic comes up for a three to six month window everywhere I go. If I sit down at brunch, the person next to me brings up that she had a miscarriage. Wow. Like it just it wouldn't go away. So I started on the short. Once I started, every person would say, Oh, remember my cousin? Or oh, you know our friend such and such had this happen. Mm -hmm. And so the stories kept growing. And at that point, I knew it was gonna like I sat down I, because I produce normally. Yes. I, this was my first time direct. I said I'm a director by default because I didn't have a budget to pay a director. <laughs> so um, so but I know how to produce very yeah. well. So I sat down and looked at okay, in order to tell this whole story, well, we can't deep dive into any topic, but we at least let the women who are 10 years behind us, 15 years behind us, um, kind of have a heads up. Because I look at my late 20s through late 30s, I spent a bunch of money traveling the world, yes. living my best life. I didn't even know to freeze my eggs. Mm -hmm. And so by the time mm -hmm. I found out about it, there was nothing that I could do. But I can at least like sound the alarm for everybody who's like coming behind us. Hey, girls, instead of or in addition to hashtag black girls travel, yes, hashtag black girl freeze your eggs <laughs> um, and, and think about your think about your fertility um, yeah. on the forefront of your while you're balancing your career or making your career choices. And so that when I looked at it on paper, it wasn't going to be a short. I was trying to figure out at that point how to make sure it wasn't a two hour feature. Yes. Um, but we had that many people. I had to cut off the interviews and just stop um because we ran out of money wow. and we were already well into i had like five hours worth of um Bitch. viable content mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we dialed it back to 90 minutes awesome and we'll get to preview the film in a little bit which is exciting um what was that like for you sitting and filming this content with these different women and hearing their stories and their experiences and recognizing that while there are many universal truths in their stories each person's path was oftentimes very different wasn't it different and oftentimes difficult mm -hmm. um i say that this this was like the assignment of life is it was a weighty assignment and of course there's joy when you see um someone who may have saw a post that we did on instagram yeah. or um social media and they went and got their fsh or their amh mm -hmm. testing and now they figure oh i'm going into menopause i didn't know so let me go and have a baby yeah. so to see those pregnancies because we've been on this journey for four yeah. years now so we've seen babies come from just the post that we said like hey guys y'all need to pay attention so that part of it has been a joy mm -hmm. the actual sitting and interviewing everybody like i said most of them are my friends so a lot of stories I lived those journeys yes, um, with them. So it mm -hmm. wasn't information to me, but them having to go back to a painful place. And I'm so appreciative that they even talked to us because early on, we couldn't get anybody to talk. <laughs> but once it's a couple of people started talking, project, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's not just taboo, it's difficult because you have to go back to a place of pain. Yeah, and who wants to sign up for that? Um, but once they can see the big picture of how many people like we screened pieces of it at Essence Fest, I think it was mm -hmm. 2017. Mm -hmm. And once we it was um called Clips and Conversations. Once we did that, um, and the women were literally sobbing and crying, mm -hmm. and it was like send me to a doctor. Yeah. Um, so once we were able to do that, I think more women felt comfortable opening up because they could see that it was not just to like use our, our you know, benefit from it, but it would help yeah. the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're so correct because I applaud your OBGYN for initiating the conversation with you. 
Um, but we certainly do wish that conversation gets initiated at an earlier stage, at age 30, yeah. even 28, 29. And it's because each woman's ovaries does age in a different timeline as well. And so mm -hmm. while some women will still have a very nice high number of viable eggs for freezing at 35, for others, that number takes a steep drop starting around 28 to 30. And for a smaller yep. handful of women, even earlier than that. And so I love though that the general OBGYN did bring it up because that annual exam visit is really a critical time for OBGYNs and family practitioners who are watching us today and watching us from around the world. My encouragement is that you talk to your patients about their fertility planning during the annual examination, recognizing that their plans may change from year to year as well. You know, I certainly met women who, you know, they were in committed relationships, long-term relationships, felt like this was the partner, but not the time for pregnancy. And so they'll say in their annual this year, not this year, but we're working on it. And yet by the next mm -hmm. annual, they may no longer be with that long-term partner that they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life with or building that family with. And so yep. it's really important that our practitioners, doctors, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, start having this conversation when they're having that annual examination. So in addition to talking about the pap smear, the breast exam, you know, the sexually transmitted infection screen, we should at least be also asking them, what are your plans for future fertility? And Absolutely. reducing that concept <laughs> of the fact that for women, we're born with a fixed number of eggs. We, we don't have eggs that we keep making the rest of our lives, yet most of us think so because we've never been told. I mean, it's not a conversation that happens in biology class. It's not a, uh, a conversation that happens in health class. It's not happening at church. It's not really happening at brunch. And so we need to bring it up. So I applaud you and I'm so excited that you were able to do this. I think now's a good time for us to watch the preview and then we can come back and talk some more about okay. eggs over easy. What do you think? I'm here for it. All right, let's do it. One second here. Let me pull it up. Today is a big day. We are headed to see your wife fertility to get our test results for our blood work. Really, really nervous. Excited. But nervous. Very anxious. And um, we're on the way. So the results that we're going for today are basically results that are going to determine whether we're a great candidate for IVF. Um, some of the tests that they, that they ran with my blood work, that will let them know if I have any eggs left. And if so, how many eggs do I have? So it's just, it really falls under the same, the, like one big umbrella. And the bottom line is, will today's blood work determine if I'm a great candidate for IVF? and where we go from here, what are our next steps? So we just want good news, so we just believe in good news. I'm gonna start crying. I'm sorry. That's okay, it's a very emotional path, very emotional. <sighs> Every day across the country, some woman is being asked the intrusive question of, when are you starting a family? Girl, you know you're getting older. When are you having a baby? So the optimal time for a woman to try and get pregnant is during her 20s and 30s. But that is also the time when a woman, a professional woman, is either peaking in their career or still pursuing their career. In my 20s and 30s, I was in medical school, residency, and for me, that wasn't the optimal time for um, to get pregnant. When I was growing up, you know, we really never had conversations with your parents about reproduction. Um, the only thing that you were told when you were young is you don't get pregnant. I have never felt a calling to have children and I just had to accept that's who I am. When I made a decision to not have kids, I was 43. Or I would say, maybe I can stretch it out. 
maybe I could go to 44, maybe I could go to 45, hell, maybe I can go to 50, you know, and then you start seeing stuff in um, the media, celebrities, you know, they're having these babies at 48, um, then, you know, people start seeing church folks, you know, Sarah had a baby at 54. You know, after my first um, myomectomy, our fertility specialist insisted that we'd be able to get pregnant like that. She felt like it was going to be an on switch. And, um, you know, after I recovered, things weren't happening. But I had so many people around me telling me, oh, don't worry, don't stress it. You know, it's the stress that's causing it. Why? Oh, the fibroids came back. African-American women lead the world in hysterectomies. And what if you can't have a baby? What if I can't have a baby? Then that means that's not what I was here to do. When you have a miscarriage, you're supposed to pick up and keep going because that's what they did in slavery. They just picked up, kept picking cotton, kept going. I was really confused about why people didn't talk about it, but I think it's just, it's taboo because you feel like a failure. At the age of 38, I went to a center and learned about the process of preserving my eggs. And I was a bit concerned because they don't recommend you do it at that age. Just having the conversation and thinking about all the different ways you can mother, I think we need to talk about and think about about. Oh my goodness, Shaquita, that was amazing. Thank and you. It's only a preview. <laughs> yeah. It's only a preview, but you, in that preview, you already highlighted all of the things that we need to talk about, mm -hmm. all of the issues that women, especially Black women, face. And these are issues that are being faced not just in the United States, they're being faced oh, in the okay. Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah, they're being faced in the United Kingdom, Europe, the entire African continent, and of course the you know Asian countries as well as Australia and New Zealand. So, what has the reception been so far to your work? I know for our blog, we've had a number of people read the blog and message in asking, "How do I find someone to talk about this? I should look into this." What's the reception been like for you? It has been overwhelming. And I, I mentioned the Essence um, Essence Fest that year. And then we did like a film festival, um, the Black Independent Black Film Festival, right mm -hmm. shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the women's, um, like this visceral response to the content. And I think because I've edited so much, I, I, I'm not numb to the stories. Mm -hmm. It's just not a knee-jerk reaction every single time until we yeah. hit there's one part where every time it gets me, it, it's, it's almost at the one hour mark and I always have to pause there. But other than that, I, I've kind of, um, I know the stories, but watching yeah. women, they are always moved because they have stories that they, they, they haven't talked to anybody about. And one of the things, every time we have, um, we did these Facebook uh, chats, we did three yeah. Facebook chats um, right at the beginning of the pandemic because that threw us off our game. We were, trying, mm -hmm. we were supposed to do screenings and we ended up having to bring everything online. But the beauty of that was we got to see way more women than we could have at a movie theater. And mm -hmm. in that, they were in the comments saying, um, I've never talked to, my husband knows I haven't even told my mom I miscarried. X amount of times. Yeah. I've had X amount of IVF failures. Or um, I'm in treatment now and I can't tell my job. So mm -hmm. when I have to leave to go to uh, my appointments, especially if it was like IVF or like an AMA mm -hmm. mom, um, mm -hmm. I can't tell my job. So I sneak off at lunch. A lot of stress on them and it also puts their jobs at risk. It but, does. Well, yeah. we should just normalize the conversation. Like if you were a patient getting treated for something like um, diabetes or cancer, nobody mm -hmm. would think twice about you having to go to your doctor's appointment. Sure. Yet sure. with this topic, you're sneaking off to go get mm -hmm. your progesterone shots or, or um, suppositories in the middle of the day because sure. you have a down schedule. So, um, so that's part of what, what the commentary has been. Like, thank you for trying to normalize this. So I don't have to sneak off my job. Or thank you, I, I couldn't tell my mom I'm sending her this link and now yeah. I can talk to her. Mm -hmm. So they were using it. Some people were using the trailer like as a conversation starter for, okay. for their moms. Yeah. 
with them and their moms. So it's been an overwhelming response. I, I wasn't yeah. certainly wasn't expecting this. I have to tell you, for example, there's one part of the trailer that especially resonated with me. And it was the part where they kept giving examples of people who got pregnant at a more mature age, you know, yeah. including the biblical example of Sarah, yeah. which, you know, depending on the version of the Bible you're reading, Sarah finally was able to have her son somewhere between the age of 54 to 99. Yep, And that, unfortunately, albeit we know the way they calculated time was different back then. We know there have been so many translations of the Bible that numbers get conflated and changed. A lot of people use that as justification for waiting, you know, and I can tell you as or a not being proactive or not being proactive. Yes. And I can tell you as a fertility specialist, I encounter that a lot, which is I have people who tell me, well, my grandmother had my mom at 50, so I'm okay. And I think it's important for everyone to know that your grandmother, your mom, your sister's experience is not necessarily your experience. Yep. Um, I like that you brought up the part of our celebrities because there's a lot more backstory to celebrities or anyone, in fact, who you see having children at mm -hmm. ages that you historically heard were not likely to yield a pregnancy. And that's because we do have a lot of technology now, including the use of donor eggs. And so, yeah. you know, there's a lot more and everyone's entitled to their privacy. So it's okay that a celebrity does not feel like sharing their private journey and telling you the details. Mm -hmm. But it's important that someone who's in the audience not look at any individual person and decide that because their journey was a certain way, that yours will be the way, that way too. It's not one and the same. It's not. Uh, it's just not, you know? And so, for example, someone may have really excellent results with egg freezing even at age 40, while someone else is struggling at 30 to freeze eggs. And so mm -hmm. it's important to know that as well. And so the, the trailer, I mean, I got goosebumps from the trailer. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm sure the audience is seeing that too. I think, you know, my goal from our talk today is so that people will know to go find the trailer, which we'll share the link here in the comments. I want them to find the trailer, mm -hmm. share the trailer, but also initiate that conversation. Because like you said, it needs to become a commonplace conversation. It shouldn't be one of last resort. Um, and not when you're this age. Like I'm 45 now. So yes. the, the couple that you saw in the clip, um, Charmaine, Charmaine and Tario Broom, Yes. She was like 32 years old when they first started trying, 32 to 35, with no response and a misdiagnosis. A misdiagnosis which actually pushed, possibly pushed her into menopause. So this, in the film, we they were just finding out the real diagnosis. No, it was not PICOS. It was premature ovarian failure. And we try to fix that. Um, yes. And then once yes. someone took the time, to, a doctor took time to talk to her, her mom had to use Clomid, and and she, um, Charmaine has a twin brother, so mm -hmm. it wasn't just her; it was actually po probably genetic. Um, yes. And this wasn't a forty-five-year-old woman. She was, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. now she might be thirty-six, thirty-seven. But mm -hmm. when we first started, and even prior to us starting filming them, she and Tario had already been trying. Yes. So yes. don't wait till forty-five to ask your mm -hmm. doctor, "Can you check my FSH? What is my yeah. AMH? Can you just help me out a little bit?" Mm -hmm. And it's really important for us to point that out because within the black community, we're very proud of the adage, black doesn't crack. We love it. We love it. We're proud of the yeah. fact that we could be here live and unless you told people you were 45, <laughs> you're sitting there looking 25 and you feel good about it. You know? yes. But the truth is our eggs age. It doesn't matter how amazingly well-preserved we look. Those eggs are on their own path of aging, which includes the numbers dropping and the eggs that are remaining are aging with us. And the truth is our eggs are formed even before we're born. And so it's important that we keep that in mind. And I think, you know, that's why I'm so excited about this conversation, excited about your film, excited that with, you know, COVID finally starting to be under control, that audiences will get to see this documentary in short order. I'm excited. Yes really excited i think you know i definitely want you coming back i would love to come back 
I, you might be too famous for me then, but I would love for you to come back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and talk more about the film and the screening, and maybe we can even screen it here if you know if that is permissible. We'll we'll talk about that too at the time, or if not, we'll host a screening somewhere. I yes. think you know. This is a conversation that needs to happen. I am putting the word out now to the audience. Thank you know, you. be on the lookout for this film. And when it comes out, host the screening in your local community. Host the screening wherever you are in the world. You know, and mm -hmm. Shaquita, we talked about this a little bit offline, which is even some of the work you started seeing being done internationally around yes and fertility awareness because this film isn't simply here to tell people freeze your eggs it's here to talk about fertility in general and just raise awareness yeah correct correct tell us a little bit about some of the international efforts that you've participated in or had the um ability to weigh in on okay so well one of the we we knew early on that we want to be throughout the African diaspora. That's everywhere. Um, and so we started researching, well, what are the platforms and who is where and who is doing what? And um, if you look at Burundi, the president's wife has um, last year and the year before been on a campaign to destigmatize infertility or fertility issues, because in some cultures, um, they they. they it's just harsher. Like it's more harsh than being in America. Your husband can divorce you if you're not. They put you out of the walls of the community. Yeah, you're, you're ostracized. You lose everything. Like you're not just not able to have a child. It has like financial ramifications that we don't have to deal with here. So yeah. in other pockets of the world, these things are happening. So I don't want to say like, there's more weight on it, on, on fertility and other cultures, but that's a fact. It, it can. Not, it can. We don't it can. have it easy in America. Entire existence, exactly. In our community, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so part of what they were doing in Burundi is trying to just destigmatize, so that you don't lose your job and lose your husband and lose your family and get kicked outside or um yeah. have to go to like a spiritual doctor and then if you're still not fixed, they they sometimes brand you as a witch. That mm -hmm. happened. That yes. was new to me because I wasn't very familiar with mm -hmm. with fertility ongoings and other cultures. Um, so just trying to say, okay, she might not be a witch. She probably has a, um, her fallopian tooth may be blocked. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that you could probably do that. But you're very right because historically, and as a student of medical history and spiritual medical history, you're very correct there, which is you look across cultures around the world, across mm -hmm. different religious leanings and even animist religions, fertility is tied in right there from the start. Yeah. And you're right, there are lots of mythological stories mm -hmm. about witches and unnatural people parading as humans. And the way to figure out that they're not really human is that they can't bear children. And so, yes, if this you're new to me, I had, yeah. I, I was very, I was unfamiliar. But it's true, you know. I mean, well, even in contemporary culture, if you look at The Witcher, have you seen The Witcher? I haven't. No. I want to give you a lot. But there's a scene in The Witcher which has to do with um, she's a witch, and she, in order to get her immortality, she gave up her womb. Right. And I found that to be a very telling wow. scene because, you know, the Witcher, for example, wow. takes a lot of storylines from medieval times. And yes, that was a belief back then that part of your power, in order to gain your powers and to gain even immortality, you trade something and you trade the thing you as a woman want the most, which in her yeah, case, wow. her ability to have future offspring. And so, yeah, but it's important we have this conversation because we're changing minds, not just yeah. the minds of the women who maybe need to think about fertility, but we're changing the minds of the in-laws, the spouse, yes. the neighbors, the, the mother, the mother, who wants the grandchild. Yes, yes. Named after her. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's true. It's real. You know, I see quite a few international patients. And as you just said that, I'm reminded of one wherein, you know, she literally was on the phone crying because she needed to prove she could conceive before her mother-in-law to be would really approve of the wedding. 
And for some people listening, that may shock them, but it's part of what the reality is for some people in some yeah. cultures. Yeah. The mother-in-law didn't care that there was love there. She actually liked the young woman based on this young woman's retelling to me. But because she had inquired and found out that the young woman was having trouble with her periods, already having some symptoms of hot flashes, etc., that pressure was already on her, which is you need to go get checked out before you marry my son. And so, yes, 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 indeed. There's a lot of just so much packed in there that we need to unpack that this could easily be a conversation in a series as well. Yeah. Now we have some members of the audience who've weighed in. So Joanne coming saying, I oh, wish okay. I had this information then. Um, yeah. Joanne is sharing. Uh, Stephanie Thomas is locked in. Uh, Dr. Wilson says, loving this interview will do a better job of incorporating this into my routine. Yes, Dr. Wilson, yes. yes. Your fellow Black OB guide, Michelle Benoit Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Yes. That's really our goal today is to reach a diverse audience, not just of potential patients, but also of everyone else in the support community and also within the medical community because it takes us coming from every angle to help break down this these misconceptions, uh, break down the barrier that kept information from our communities and really encourage people to understand that what we're talking about today isn't just something sensational. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be sensational, but it's life. It's it is. Life. It is. Yeah. yeah. Now, Shakita, how Shakita, how can we find you on social okay. media, etc., going forward? So on Instagram, we are at um, Eggs Over Easy Film. Mm -hmm. um, our website is eggsovereasyfilm.com at yeah. Facebook we're slash eggsovereasyfilm so that's the quickest way and we're most active on um, Instagram Instagram, awesome so and like we, if anybody wants to get in touch there are a few, we have like a team it's not just me um, so yeah. somebody at least will, will respond to you respond. quicker than if you just try to email or something Wonderful. And for the audience who's listening, what is your what do you want them to have as a takeaway from today's brief conversation? Um, I would like for them to just make sure that they're talking about fertility amongst their core group. Not everybody has Oprah Winfrey's platform and can talk or Dr. Cindy's platform and can talk to the whole wide world, but you can talk to the person closest to you. You could talk to your nieces, you could talk to your friends, you could talk to your mom, your aunts, um, your mentees, the people in your circle. That's your garden for you to tend. Those are the lives um, that you have access to. And I do believe like, um, I think we're, we're, we're accountable for the people who God puts in our space. So if you yeah. can have this conversation, it's not just even a all women's conversation because mm -hmm. on the other side of fertility, the other part of that couple will require sperm. Yes. That's regardless of uh, whether you're gay, straight, mm -hmm. um, right. wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, an egg and a sperm is still required. So that is still a piece of the conversation. So maybe also include your sons. And then when we look at couples um, who are trying to, to have kids, there's usually, you know, a guy on the other side who's trying to navigate in, in the film Tario. He's, he was so generous in letting us see all the emotions. He's sitting there trying to figure out why is her body doing all this stuff and she's in pain and do we go to the hospital? Like, do they need to put her on a machine or IV or something because it's so bad. So we see that side of it too. So yes, of course we're talking to black women, but it's people who love black women as well. So yes. Very true. I love what you highlighted there, which is we also need to start having the conversation early, right? It's yes. not, if you have someone who's already in their 30s, 40s, talk to them now too. But we should also be initiating this conversation with our 20 year olds, et cetera. So, you know, like you pointed out, for many young women, as they come into more financial independence or more discretionary income, mm -hmm. some of the first things they do is we, we start traveling, we want to see the world, we want to explore that independence, but we really should consider using some of that discretionary funding to also yes. put some eggs away. And the younger you freeze your eggs, the better for you should you need to use them, which is, you don't necessarily have to use your frozen eggs. You may find that you don't, whether you decide not to start a family 
or you're spontaneously pregnant or pregnant without the need for in vitro services. But should you come across the need for it, by that time, it may be too late if you hadn't frozen some eggs yes. at the time. So that's like one insurance policy. policy. It's an insurance policy, exactly. And similarly with fibroids, I love that in your trailer, you mentioned, you know, I forgot his name, but he said, black women have the highest numbers of hysterectomies the world That's over. Answer. And that is indeed driven by the fact that pretty much nine out of 10 of us have fibroids. Not all of us will have fibroids that require intervention. Same here, same yes. here, you know, but the number one reason for the, abnormal bleeding, the bloating, the discomfort, the misshapen uterus, a number of things stem from fibroids. Yes. And many times the conversation about fibroids doesn't include fertility preserving methods. It goes straight from, you have fibroids, the way to solve this is to take out the womb. And yes. for many women, they're looking for an in-between, which exists. It's called fertility preservation or myomectomy, when done with the right person and who takes the right steps yeah. with and the UFE, like even less invasive, the embolization yes. is less invasive right. than yes. a whole myomectomy. There are options and we don't have to go straight to a hysterectomy, although that is always usually offered. It's usually offered and people jump to it. Um, and yes, it solves the problem. It solves yeah. the problem. But if you're someone who's looking to have children, unless you have access to a surrogate, once you have a hysterectomy, you're now in a very different place in terms of what you're able to do going forward um, uh, in terms of biological motherhood. Now, you can still adopt, obviously, and we haven't really gone into that part of the conversation, but that's a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we have a number of our LinkedIn users who are saying they love that we're talking about this. Thank you guys for tuning in. You know, for those who are listening, I'm Dr. Cindy Duke, and I'm on with my guest and friend, Shaquita Lockley, hey. producer and first time director. Yes. And guys, do please check out her film, Eggs Over Easy Film. Like she said, she's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. No, we're not on Twitter. Okay. So Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Shaquita is also my first guest blog on the Dr. Cindy Duke website. And, and she I wrote didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, mean, I, I still remember because as soon as we posted it and I got a message saying, Dr. Duke, we have a submission. I was like, really? No way. <laughs> it's like, yes, there's a submission. And I just, I was like, oh, I've got to read this. So yes. really excited. I had fun with this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for um, having me. I, I look forward to the premiere and we're going to find a way to do this premiere and not just in yes. the United States, but elsewhere as well, yes. because this is a conversation that needs to be had in all 52 countries in the African continent, all the countries in the European uh, Union and outside of the Union in Asia, uh, Australia, the Caribbean, yes. and the United States. And it's not a conversation that you could ever have too much of, um, but we do need to raise awareness. That's what we're here to do. It's just, we, it needs to become part of the conversation, like Shaquita said, the way we talk about diabetes, the way we approach diabetes if we're on the job, the way we tell people at work if we have a cancer diagnosis, et cetera. Yeah. The hope is infertility gets to that point so that you're not ashamed to say you're going to get treatment. You're not ashamed to seek treatment because that's another reason why some people delay treatment or evaluation is they just don't want people to know that this is something. And that's so sad. It's very sad. It's very sad. So Shaquita, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you again, and we will see you again next time. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.